Just before we get started with this video, I do want to say that it's brought to you by me, or rather another channel that I do called Business Blaze. Business Blaze is about business, but it's interesting. It looks at the most epic failures and times things went wrong, but also at little known success is generally just the weirdest stuff that I could find from the business world, like why the £50 note in the UK is for criminals, stuff like that. It's more laid back than this channel, throwing a good amount of silliness and fun at you, along with some facts. Check it out through the link below and let's get into today's video. Debuting in 1997, South Park has gone from being regarded as a crudely animated show filled with fart jokes to an Emmy award-winning cultural touchstone that has been lauded by critics for its apparent fearlessness in tackling or addressing even the most taboo subjects with unrivaled intelligent satire and fart jokes and crude animations. The result has seen Trey Parker and Matt Stone going from being two typically broke college students to today having a combined reported net worth of $1.3 billion and still rising. South Park's genesis can be traced back to 1988, specifically the first time Stone and Parker met while attending a film class at the University of Colorado. According to the pair, they became fast friends due to a shared love of subversive humor and one of the most revolutionary shows of all time, Monty Python. The first example of what would be recognized as the precursor to South Park came about in 1992 when Parker created a short film entitled American History for a college animation class using construction paper cut out animation. Despite the crudely animated nature of the short, Parker would later gleefully recall that it won him a Student Academy Award. The duo would later use the same animation technique while collaborating on another short officially dubbed Spirit of Christmas in 1992. The three minute 52 second video is basically a parody of Frosty the Snowman, only in this version, Frosty goes on an evil, murderous rampage, prompting the main characters to seek help from Santa and later Jesus. <laughs> As you do. Painstakingly created using construction paper, glue, and according to the pair, a very old camera, the short features numerous recognizable elements of the South Park franchise. The most obvious being that the main characters are four young boys, three of which bear some resemblance to the cast of the show as you'd recognize them today. A notable difference is that in this early short, the only named character is the one resembling Cartman, who is named Kenny. Other recognizable aspects include the crude humor, the gag involving the character of Kenny being killed, and a closing monologue beginning with the words, But you know, I learned something today. Yeah, don't put the magic hat on Frosty. The short was well received by Stone and Parker's friends and classmates and was sufficiently popular to draw the attention of a then Fox executive called Brian Graydon, who at the time was in charge of securing alternate programming for the network. Impressed by the duo's work ethic and humor, Graydon contracted them to produce a Christmas themed animated video card in the style of Spirit of Christmas to send to his friends. For this, Graydon paid the pair $1,000, which is about $1,900 today. This second short, also called Spirit of Christmas, Christmas was again created using the laborious construction paper cutout method utilized for the previous short. However, being a paid gig and with a little more experience, it is notable for its markedly improved quality over the original. This time, the short centers around a fight scene between Jesus and Santa. All right. It also features all four main characters from the later show, all of whom are named and have basically the same personalities and voices from the first few seasons. Once completed, Graydon paid the pair their money and emailed the short to eight friends. In a modern-day version of the genesis of the Christmas card short story that became the film It's a Wonderful Life, from here, those friends then sent the spirit of Christmas to some of their friends, who in turn sent it to their friends, and so on and so on, until the short became a viral video hit, famously one of the first in internet history. Can't believe I've never seen this. Incidentally, one of the more notable people to receive a copy of the short in their email inbox was the actor George Clooney, who was an instant fan and is largely credited with helping the short go viral. It's also worth noting that when South Park first began to become popular, Stone and Parker deliberately offered celebrities who inquired about guest roles on the show small, insignificant parts just to see how they'd react. George Clooney, for example, happily provided barks for Stan's dog, while Henry Winkler had no problem with voicing a child-eating monster by providing a number of growling noises. Jerry Seinfeld, on the other hand, is said to have refused to appear in an episode after the pair offered him the role of turkey number three in a Thanksgiving episode. 
<laughs> These guys are legends. In any event, noticing how popular the Christmas short had become, Graydon lobbied for Fox to hire Stone and Parker to produce a series based around it in 1996. The duo, in an early example of their tendency to push the envelope, basically torpedoed their chance at getting the show greenlit by absolutely insisting that the show needed to contain a piece of talking poo called Mr. Hanky. Despite being, you know, Fox, even then a network known for churning out a remarkable amount of figurative crap, the network poo-pooed the idea of showing literal crap and refused to pick up the show. However, the buzz allowed the duo to court both MTV and Comedy Central, with the pair deciding to work for the latter out of fear of MTV censoring or otherwise neutering their personal brand of comedy. With a budget in hand, Stone and Parker decided to really see how much they could get away with and penned the pilot episode, Carmen Gets an Anal Probe. A deliberate attempt to skewer political correctness and mock the champions of family values trying to censor shows like The Simpsons, Carmen Gets an Anal Probe was crammed with as much profanity as the pair felt they could get away with, which they knew would be doubly shocking seeing as the show's main characters were all eight-year-old children. Speaking of which, according to the duo Stan and Carla loosely based on themselves, with Stan representing Parker and Carl representing Stone. On this note, Trey Parker's dad's name is Randy Parker, and like Randy Marsh, he's a geologist. Sharon Parker is an insurance broker, unlike Sharon Marsh, who is a receptionist at Tom's Rhinoplasty. In addition to that, Shelley Marsh on South Park is also named after Trey Parker's older sister, Shelley. Matt Stone's mother, Sheila Stone, is also Jewish, much like Sheila Broflovsky. The last name Broflovsky is derived from Sheila Stone's maiden name, Broslovsky, which was later changed to Alaska when her family immigrated to the United States. Stone's father, Gerald Whitney Stone, is an economics professor, unlike Gerald Broflovsky, who is a lawyer. Stone also has a sister named Rachel, but creating a character for her in the Broflovsky South Park family was ruled out because they felt Stan and Carl were already too much alike. Instead, they gave Carl an adopted younger brother, Ike. Moving on to other characters, the character of Kenny is based on that one poor kid who was always apparently part of every friend group. Kenny's trademark Parker and habit of dying every episode is said to be inspired by an old classmate of Parker's who similarly wore a Parker all the time, muffling his voice much like the character of Kenny. Further, Kenny apparently skipped class frequently, leading to a running joke among Parker and his friends that he had died. Lastly, the character of Carmen is a pastiche of, to quote them, the annoying fat kid from everyone's past, as well as being a loose parody of Archie Bunker from All in the Family. In specific regards to the way all four characters speak, Stone and Parker wanted their language to be reflective of how kids really talk when they're alone, which is why all four boys openly use profanities as well as occasional homophobic sexual and racial slurs. To quote Stone, Kids are all little bastards. They don't have any kind of social tact or etiquette. They're just complete little raging bastards. But back to the show's pilot episode. It reportedly took well over three months to produce and is noteworthy for being the only episode in the entire franchise to be produced using actual construction paper and stop motion. Every episode thereafter has been produced using high-end computer animation software. To quote an incredulous stone from a 1997 interview about the software they used back then, it is used for Jurassic Park and sh**. Yes, the 1990s, everybody. Beyond the simple, readily reusable animation style, this unprecedented turnaround time per episode is largely because most everything related to the show is accomplished in-house in a single set of offices, with episodes literally not being written until a week before they're due to air. The duo credit having so little time to come up with ideas is the reason why the show has remained so fresh, as it encourages both relevance to current topics still in people's minds, as well as spontaneity and not overthinking anything. So, yes, Stone Stone and Parker write a hit Emmy award-winning show that has made them and Comedy Central Scrooge McDuck money the way most of us write college essays at the last minute, finishing usually just a few hours before the deadline. There we go. Going back to Carmen Gets an Anal Probe, the show was almost killed in the crib when Comedy Central previewed the episode for test audiences and found that they almost unanimously hated it, with women being especially critical of the show's content. It was only due to the strength of the spirit of Christmas shorts enduring popularity that the network took a chance on it anyway. And hey, let's face it, it was 1990s Comedy Central. What they had that people watched was The Daily Show. And The Daily Show.
The gamble paid off. To illustrate, in 1997, Comedy Central had a reach of about 9 million households, and their highest rated show was earning only $7,500 per 30 second commercial spot. A mere year later, largely on the back of South Park, they had jumped to being broadcast in over 50 million households, and the average cost of a 30 second network commercial was $40,000, with South Park itself earning $80,000 per 30 second ad at that point. Now, naturally, the show was hugely controversial controversial right from the start, both seeing its ratings skyrocket and gaining an incredible amount of criticism in the media and among certain parent groups led by Karens the world over. Taking it in their stride in response to early criticism, suggesting that South Park was nothing but a base-level, crudely animated show containing nothing of more substance than its fart jokes, the pair created the characters Terence and Philip, who, within the context of the show, are Canadian comedians who only tell fart jokes and are deliberately animated more poorly than the other characters. Over the years, the show has gone on to be recognized and indeed lauded for its unflinching, often unique and surprisingly deep fare, and well-thought-out takes on social issues of the time. Particular episodes they were generally well applauded for include the likes of being praised by the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, GLAAD, for the episode Big Gay Owls, Big Gay Boat Ride, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, commending the show's sensitive and nuanced portrayal of the impact of the N-word in the episode With Apologies to Jesse Jackson, and the Tourette Syndrome Association complimenting the show's well-researched and highly accurate representation of Tourette Syndrome, a rarity in Hollywood, in the episode Le Petit Tourette. Surprisingly, given there is no one and no topic off limits, and over the years the pair have lampooned almost every group, race, and religion, this has only ever really caused friction behind the scenes twice. Once when they planned to air an episode featuring an image of Muhammad, and another time in an episode mocking Scientology. The episode showing an image of Muhammad, simply called 201, was heavily censored by Comedy Central in response to threats from certain extremist Muslim groups towards the studio and Stone and Parker personally. The pair found the censorship ridiculous, especially considering the show had repeatedly mocked figures such as Jesus and Buddha, but in this case, the pair respected Comedy Central's decision because, to quote executives, they didn't want to be blown up. The episode mocking Scientology, on the other hand, called Trapped in the Closet, caused no friction between Stone, Parker, and Comedy Central, with the pair recalling that they were pleasantly surprised when the network gave them the go-ahead to mock Tom Cruise and this particular famously litigious organization, especially as the show included revealing information that the organization had previously managed to keep secret from all but their biggest donating members. The issue with this one, however, was then-series mainstay Isaac Hayes, who voiced Chef. Hayes, who was a Scientologist himself, refused to take part in an episode mocking his faith. Stone and Parker thus decided to release Hayes from his contract without incident and issued a short statement, We never heard a peep out of Isaac in any way until we lampooned Scientology. He wants a different standard for religions other than his own, and to me, this is where intolerance and bigotry begin. But in the end, when you make fun of everyone, whether equally, intelligently, and with a surprising amount of fairness to all perspectives, and even empathy at times or not, pretty much every episode of the show gets criticized by some group or other, something Stone and Parker completely understand, once being quoted as saying, We've been waiting to get cancelled for 18 f years. In fact, according to the duo, they've intentionally been trying to see how far they can push what they could get away with for over two decades now, and are still consistently surprised when they get given the go-ahead to make episodes about the topics they do. Of course, it helps that the franchise has brought in in excess of a billion dollars to date and is still going strong. For example, a recent deal for streaming rights of the show was bought for a whopping $500 million. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that thumbs up button below. Also, if you enjoy businessy episodes like this one, definitely check out my other channel, Business Blaze, which I will link to below. And thank you for watching.